So it's uh, our next speaker is Dr. David Barbic. Uh, David's a practicing emergency physician at St. Paul's and a clinical assistant professor in emergency medicine at UBC. He's a very productive researcher, and his interests include cardiovascular medicine, ECGs, systemic reviews, and marginalized populations. His spare time is filled uh, spending time with his young family and running on the North Shore Mountain with his dog. Uh, I know personally this man does not have an off switch. Rumor, <laughs> at, rumor has it he hasn't slept since 2008, but um, he's uh, going to inform us today about uh, bleeding on uh, new oral anticoagulants. Thanks, David. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you very much for having me today. My name is David. Now, this is a topic that I think is all a little bit terrifying for us. I know personally for me, the first couple of patients that I saw when I was out in practice as an independent attending, these were patients that I went, oh dear God, what do I do? So hopefully I can provide a bit of insight, some pearls that you can take back to your everyday clinical practice. Not responding. It's okay. Oh, there are my kids. <laughs> okay, not a big deal. So I have no relevant financial conflicts to disclose. I do receive uh, research funding from the St. Paul's Hospital Foundation. I'm a member of the St. Paul's Emergency Associates. And to mitigate those potential biases, I won't be talking about any of my current research interests or topics or projects. Okay. Uh, Spacebar? All right, no problem. There we go, beautiful. Ooh. Okay, so those are my disclosures. Next slide, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, the joys of technology, right? Yep, that's perfect. And next one, if you don't mind. Okay, so coming back to the topic at hand after Relevant, all my relevant disclosures. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is probably a bit of a fear-inducing kind of thought. You have this patient roll into your resuscitation bay, your trauma bay, and you're going, oh dear God, what do I do? Okay. So, ooh, back please, one, yep. Perfect, okay. So, the, fir the first major question you need to ask yourself, is this major bleeding or is this minor bleeding? Okay. So think of a 70-year-old female. She's on River Rocks Aban, a Pixaban, doesn't really matter. She comes in with some minor, moderate anterior epistaxis, or some hemorrhoidal bleeding, or she bumped her leg on the chair and she's got a bit of a laceration and a contusion. This is minor bleeding. These patients do not require reversal of their do DOACs, direct oral anticoagulant medications. Okay, major. What does major bleeding constitute? So I want you to take a minute, picture yourself in your trauma bay, your resuscitation bay, your emergency department. We've all seen these patients, you know what they look like. This is major trauma, this is a massive GI hemorrhage, this is hemoptysis. Okay, this is major bleeding. These are the people that you need to think about reversal on, okay? Not the epistaxis, not the hemorrhoids, not the superficial injuries. Key point. So if you're like me, you get one of these patients, you bury your head in your hands and you go, dear God, why did they come in on my shift and what the heck do I do now? So after the first two patients that I had in my career that were like this, I talked to my hematologist a lot, did a ton of reading, read the latest recommendations from Thrombosis Society of America and Canadian Thrombosis Society. I think we've got a pretty good approach now. Now, a key topic here is time. These patients are critically ill. They need to be treated expediently. We're not debating that. However, 
time can be your friend as well. Here's why. I want to take you back to your undergraduate pharmacology, your medical school pharmacology, and the concept of a half-life. This is really important. So half-life. We ingest a medication. After one half-life, 50% of it's out of our plasma. It's not biologically active. After two half-lives, you're down to 25%. After three half-lives, you're down to 12.5%. Key concept, half-life. So if you have a patient who is reliable and can provide a history, you're working the evening shift, they come in with a massive GI hemorrhage, it's 9 p.m., and they tell you, you know what? I haven't taken my medication in four days. I ran out. I don't take my medications. I don't like them. Or, yeah, I took my last dose yesterday morning. I just forgot this morning. I wasn't feeling well, so I didn't take my medications. That is very relevant. And we'll get to that in a second. However, you have the patient who is obtunded, who is somnolent, who can't provide any history, who's intoxicated. Unfortunately, you're going to have to assume that those patients took their DOAC the minute before they hit your front door. So, there are four major DOACs that are available in Canada. Dabigatran, which was the first, works directly on factor 2A. Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, and Edoxaban. Those are all factor 10A drugs, okay? I promise, I swear to you, I'm not gonna do a co coagulation cascade for the next slide, okay? I still get like PTSD moments from med school when I see them. <laughs> the key point here is the half-life. So the half-life varies anywhere from about eight to 17 hours. 17 hours is the top end from Dabigatran from all the phase one trials, okay? So go back to that 70-year-old She's sitting there in your emergency department, and she says, you know what, doc? I felt awful this morning. I was vomiting. I couldn't keep my medications down. I haven't had a dose in at least a day and a half. This is probably not someone you need to urgently reverse. That is a key point. The reversal agents are not without risk. This is not someone you need to urgently reverse. But if they said, yes, I took it this morning, so you're within about two half-lives, or they're not able to provide a history, unfortunately, you need to consider it. Now, itaracuzumab. Itaracuzumab is a monoclonal antibody that was direct, uh, developed by Boehringer Engelheim, the makers of uh, Dabigatran. Itaracuzumab was the great golden hope that we were gonna be able to reverse bleeding associated with Dabigatran. Now, some of you may be knowledgeable or comfortable with the study that was published in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine by Pollock and all. And they looked at itaracuzumab for reversing bleeding on dabigatran. They were able to show that patients had their coagulation parameters reversed and corrected. However, they weren't able to show meaningful patient-related outcome improvements in morbidity, mortality, and risk for major surgery. So unfortunately, itaracuzumab is a bit of a case of broken promises. And since that time, there have been case reports published showing failure with itaracuzumab. It's still in the Thrombosis Society of Canada guidelines for someone who's on dabigatran, but the evidence is not strong. So what does the future hold? Londex and at alpha, is another monoclonal antibody that has been developed, and this is to work directly against anti-10A medications, the rivaroxabans, apixabans, edoxaban, and dexanid alpha. Remember this name, you're gonna hear a lot about it in the next few years. 2016, New England Journal of Medicine, similar reversal study. They were able to show reversal of coagulation parameters, but also improvements in patient-related, clinically important outcomes. Mortality, morbidity, major bleeding, surgery. So this looks promising. However, indexin and alpha, not approved by Health Canada yet. So it's not in our armamentarium. We're probably talking six months to a year, maybe two years, depending on how fast Health Canada approves it. So 
keep that name in the back of your mind. You're going to be hearing a lot about it in the next few years, but it's not, not ready for us just yet. So, okay, David, that's nice. I have a patient who's critically ill, bleeding in front of me right now. What the heck am I supposed to do? I can just hear that from some of my colleagues. Stop pontificating on esotericism. Get down to the clinical nitty-gritty. So, what we have right now is based off expert consensus guidelines created by the Thrombosis Society of Canada. So expert thromb uh, thrombosis specialists reviewing all the evidence, case series, cohort studies. That's what we have. The good news is a lot of what we need to do is what we do already. Core bread and butter emergency medicine. Airway, breathing, circulation. You have that lovely seven-year-old. She's sitting there with a major GI hemorrhage in your trauma bay, and her very helpful husband says, can I give her her regular medications? You politely say, no, thank you. Stop their current anticoagulation. Obtain local hemostatic control, if possible. That's more relevant for sort of the major trauma type picture. If necessary, dressings, tourniquets, that kind of stuff. Now, the reality is, Itaracuzumab is still in the Thrombosis Society guidelines if you have someone who's bleeding onto Bigotran. The reality is, even at St. Paul's Academic Quaternary Care Center and most other major centers in Canada, we do not have Itaracuzumab readily available. So, what are we to do? There is some evidence that prothrombin complex concentrates, either octuplex, bariplex, may be a viable option for reversing DOAX in these patients with major hemorrhage. I repeat, major hemorrhage. Tranexamic acid, also a very viable option. If you're not sure of the doses, call your hospital pharmacist, look it up, follow your local institutional protocols, okay? So, to summarize, Airway breathing circulation, stop the current anticoagulation, hemostatic control if possible, prothrombin complex concentrates, tranexamic acid. Now a little proviso. There have been a few case reports, case series, of patients bleeding onto Bigotran who have been hemodialyzed, hemodialyzed with good effect. Now, you can probably appreciate how incredibly challenging it would be to get a bleeding, to big enough trized patient on hemodialysis. Talk about it with your renal service. Talk about it with your intensivist. But there are a few case reports in the literature. Now, another key point here is this is not the patient that you're going to reverse and stick them in the hallway and forget about them, okay? These patients need to go to the operating room. They need to go to the ICU. Or if you're in a remote, rural location, isolated location, they need to be medevaced out. Okay? These patients need higher level critical care that we cannot provide in the emergency department. Okay? I don't know about you, I've never seen an ICU with two open beds, but it's kind of a nice dream. I'd like to thank you very much all for your attention today. Um, there are no references on this talk. There is a Dropbox folder that Sandy has links to, as will Rob. So if you would like any of the resources, please feel free to email me, email Sandy, email Rob. All of it's in there. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.